Today we're going to be looking at five ultra compacts and travel strollers that we wouldn't recommend buying, and we're going to explain why. Before we get into it though, I just wanted to say that there are of course many more ultra compacts and travel strollers that we wouldn't recommend buying than are listed here. But we've picked on these in particular because most of them are from the upper end of the market, both with regards to price as well as marketing, and thus we feel there's a need to post a fair warning for unwary consumers. A second note for those unfamiliar with our channel is that we do not sell strollers, nor do we earn money from our recommendations. Our qualifications for making these recommendations are based on a decade's experience of repairing strollers for private consumers and distributors, as well as big brand manufacturers. Okay, the first stroller we wanted to focus on is the Cybex EZS Twist. The Twist is one of only a small handful of strollers attempting to provide a reversible seat on an ultra compact model, a concept which, unfortunately, brings with it very difficult engineering challenges, as the need for a separate seat unit, rather than just suspending the seat from the handle arms, means both that the seat will be smaller, and we're already talking about ultra compacts here, and also that the fold will be a good deal more complex, meaning a weaker design structurally due to an increased number of hinges and locking mechanisms than would otherwise be necessary. The twist, though, takes this idea of a reversible seat one step further and has made the seat swivel, a function whose only discernible positive, as far as I can tell, is that you don't need to remove the seat frame in order to switch its orientation. The resulting effect of this design choice, however, in addition to adding multiple complex plastic mechanisms to an already overcomplicated design, is that the baseboard of the seat is shallower than on other ultra compacts, made this way in order to pass through the chassis arms during the swivel. Coupled with a not quite upright upright position and the lack of a rear frame footrest, this shallower baseboard means that when you're using the twist reverse facing, probably the key reason you went for the model, it will often feel as though your child is slipping out of the seat, held in place only by the harness. In addition to this key design mistake, the whole chassis is also just built with too many weak hinged and locking points, such that it can often feel as though you're right on the border of breaking the twist fragile internal mechanisms whenever you need to fold it. Add to this a pair of front wheels that, right out of the box, are already pretty loose in their housings, and you wind up with a driving nightmare anytime you need to move the stroller off of the very smoothest of terrain. And to cap it all off, even with all of the complexity that's gone into the fold of the twist, its folded dimensions are still not even close to the generally accepted hand luggage guidelines. So in the end, you might as well have gone for a larger model with a lot more structural integrity. The Cybex EZS Twist is seriously discounted these days a lot of places, but that doesn't make it a stroller that you should buy. The next stroller that we wouldn't recommend buying is the Silvercross Jet, which is one of our bigger disappointments of last year. From first looking at the Jet, it actually seemed quite nice, with larger than average rear wheels, a decently sized seat, and perhaps most importantly, a design departure from the pure umbrella setup that they've held onto for decades. All this of course in addition to the leather and shiny plastic bits that have always given Silvercross that slightly more flashy look. After having a closer look however, a number of relatively serious problems with the model became apparent. Firstly, the Jet is built as a sort of hybrid between the traditional umbrella design and a more modern industry standard approach, giving it not only a vertical, but a horizontal fold, which might have been a good idea if the horizontal fold had been utilized to provide a wider than average seat, but unfortunately turned out to be really just a gimmick, a throwback to the model's umbrella roots. Meaning that, in my opinion, all you're really getting out of those horizontally hinged and locking elements is an added plane of weakness. And in my experience, adding the potential for horizontal looseness to the pre-existing potential for vertical looseness just leads to a much more rickety chassis over time, as well as causing symmetry issues that wear down the internal components of a stroller's various locking mechanisms. In addition to this, the chief locking point, located on the handle arms, is built in a pretty fragile manner. And since releasing our standalone review of this model, we have now encountered multiple instances where that point has in fact broken. Arguably worse than these structural weaknesses though, when you really go under the hood, is that the Jet has a number of worrisome features not readily apparent when first looking at the model, which suggests to me at least, that it's built more as a use and throw away as soon as it has problems type of model. Firstly, the textiles are screwed to the chassis and are incredibly difficult to remove should you need to wash them. Secondly, the wire-based brake system does not have an adjustment screw, and the rear wheel housings which contain the rest of the brake system are riveted together, making disassembly virtually impossible when brake problems eventually occur. And lastly, and worst of all, the Jet doesn't have ball bearings in its wheels, and its wheels have been riveted directly to the chassis, which means that once those rivet axles wear down the plastic channels in the wheels, you'll be stuck with loose wheels that are impossible to replace, at least as far as the rear wheels are concerned. This lack of ball bearings and riveting the wheels directly to the chassis is also just pretty far off the industry standard when looking at more or less every other premium manufacturer. And the fact that it's all hidden away beneath plastic covers feels sort of sneaky to me, especially on a model that is definitely not cheap. There is some discussion online that these faults may have been rectified with the 2020 model, but so far I can't find an actually actual posted list of what has changed on the jet, 
So for the moment, I certainly wouldn't recommend buying the 2020 version either, until there is solid confirmation that a wide array of problems have been thoroughly addressed. Okay, moving on then we come to the Boogaboo Ant, which might be surprising to a number of you, as Boogaboo is generally a pretty solid company who takes care to produce unique quality products, but in our opinion, the Ant has a number of misguided design elements which make it not worth the price. To start with, the Ant, like the Twist, has a reversible seat, which again means a smaller seat. And while the Ant's baseboard is sufficiently deep to keep your child from falling out, also like the Twist, it doesn't have a footrest on the rear frame. In addition though, the Ant's seat also lacks seat walls, and like a lot of Ultra Compacts, doesn't have a leg rest, meaning that when reclining, there is nothing to keep your child's arms and legs from dangling into space, which, I don't know whether you agree with me, is not a very comfortable position to take a nap. In addition to this, the canopy is positioned right off the top of the seat back, thus providing zero clearance for the head of an older toddler. In truth, the seat of the ant could have been built a little larger, but as with Cybex's clever swivel, the ant wants to sell itself on a gimmick, the ability to fold down into a fake wheelable suitcase. I say fake suitcase because remember, you can't actually fill it, it's already all full of stroller. In my opinion, despite how cool it looks, this fake suitcase mode is actually useless in the real world. A shoulder strap would have been way better, as you can already wheel around a stroller with the added benefit of having somewhere to put your kid. Yet, when you get into the mechanical specifics of the Ant, it becomes clear that the vast majority of engineering decisions on the model have arguably been undertaken in order to facilitate this useless transformation, and the result is a stroller whose seat and wheels are too small, and whose sheer number of components and mechanisms are not only already loose and frustrating to use right out of the box, but are likely to get even looser over time, as well as to lead to symmetry issues as a stroller wears down. The origami-like seat unit is the worst part of this, but the handle is problematic as well being composed of three telescopic bars and a central activation trigger connected to multiple fragile internal locking mechanisms. So again, we like Boogaboo in general, but the Ant is poorly conceived and problematically executed in our opinion, and it ain't cheap either. Alright, pushing forward then we get to the GB Pocket Plus, whose main issue really is that it will be somewhere between suboptimal and useless for most people, though to its credit, there is a very small niche of lifestyles out there that are able to make proper use of it. The GB Pocket Plus is incredibly ridiculously weak, you see, made primarily of plastic and composed of many, many hinges and locking mechanisms such that it can be folded down to the point where it's only a little more than half the size of the Baby Zen Yo-Yo Plus. And that's its selling point. It's not a stroller that folds down small enough to fit within standard cabin luggage guidelines. It is the smallest and lightest folding stroller, period. And the problem with this, in my opinion, is that it's actually been made so small that there's not really much stroller left. Sure, as a folded object, you can easily take it anywhere. You can stick it in your suitcase and still have room for your clothes and stuff. But as a stroller, it's weak and loose and rickety. It won't handle any terrain really other than smooth indoor environments or really well-maintained pavement. Its brake system, like its folding mechanisms, is complicated and fragile and not really repairable. Its seat is tiny, not completely closed, and with the bare minimum of a semi-recline. And in fact, it's so small that I would really not recommend using it with a child older than a year and a half and I would definitely not recommend using the bassinet option for a newborn. And even if all of these limitations aren't a problem for you, if you were to buy it, I also would not recommend using it very often. Just for a short vacation maybe. A cruise. That would be the ideal use of the GB Pocket Plus. If you have a child between six months and a year and a half, and you want something to wheel around a cruise ship for a week or so. If that's worth the cost for you, then go for it. Otherwise, really, there are better options. And to top it off, it has dual wheel setup. But we're not going to talk about that here because that's the number one ultra compactor travel stroller that I wouldn't recommend buying. Any stroller with a dual wheel setup. Seriously. The dual wheel setup is an old standard of travel strollers, still most commonly seen on umbrella strollers, but in a few unfortunate instances, like the GB Pocket, brought over to other designs as well. And as far as I can tell, the only real reason it can be seen so many places is that Owen McLaren, the founder of McLaren and inventor of the umbrella design, was an aeronautics engineer and he based the wheels of his stroller, as well as the cross-hatched way in which it collapses, on airplane landing gear. Now, an airplane has dual wheels for stability as it lands. The dual wheels give the landing gear a wider footprint, reducing the risk that your few million dollars of worth of aircraft will tip over and get smashed on the tarmac. But this is a stroller, and my hope is that you're actually holding it as you wheel it around. Dual wheel setups on strollers are unnecessary. They're harder to pivot, they get looser quicker, they make for more problematic brake systems, they're harder to fix, and they were conceived in a time when the materials necessary to build proper forks, most importantly durable plastics, hadn't been invented yet. Like the umbrella design as a whole, it's about time to get rid of dual wheels in my opinion. We've come up with much better stuff at this point. In any case, we hope you enjoyed this video. 
If you'd like to check out any of the models mentioned here in more depth, we've added links to their respective standalone reviews in this video's description. We'd also like to ask you to subscribe if possible, as this helps us to continue making videos in the future.